we're going to begin right now. All right. Um, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, so this event is basically going against the curve, Iranians in non-STEM professions. And so essentially for today's event, we're going to be introducing our core members. So hello, everyone. My name is Farzana. Talib Eliassi, if you want to know the full version. Um, and I am one of the core members for this community. I am part of the University of California, Riverside, and I'm part of my ISC or my Iranian student organization there. Um, and yeah, go to the next person. Melissa, would you like to go next? Thank you, Farzana. Hi, everyone. My name is Melissa Tusimer. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a second year political science major at Cal Poly San Luis Obispo. Our Iranian organization is called the Iranian Student Cultural Organization, uh, long for ISCO. Um, and I'm part of the Iranian Diaspora Committee um, in the Iranian Students of California, ISC. Layla, would you like to introduce yourself next? Thank you, Melissa. It's so amazing to be among you folks. Uh, I am Leila Zanuzi, uh, president of ISC, and also an, like an honor, honorary member of the Iranian Diaspora Committee, committee here. And um, I'm doing my PhD in Global Studies at UC Santa Barbara. Um, Nika, do you want to go next? Sure, thank you so much. Hello, everyone. Very exciting to see you all and to be here with you. Um, my name is Nika Chegeni Zadeh, pronouns is she, her, hers. Um, I'm a third year public policy major um, with Farazana at Riverside. Um, and I'm also part of the Iranian Student Association there. And I also serve on the diaspora committee here uh, with ISC. Um, Ariana, you want to go ahead? Hi, everyone. My name is Ariana and my, I use she, her, her pronouns. Um, I am a fourth year ethnic studies major at Cal Poly Slow and like Melissa, I'm a part of the Iranian student organization there, um, ISCO, and I'm also a part of the Iranian diaspora committee for ISC. And Bahar? Hi everyone, so glad to be a part of you guys today. Um, my name is Bahar Babugali. I'm actually a senior in high school, I'm not in college yet. Um, I'm part of the Iranian diaspora committee and um, I actually have a group called Chai Talk. I don't know if you guys have heard of it or not. Uh, it's basically like a discussion group that uh, we meet almost every other week and we discuss really interesting topics within the Persian culture. And um, yeah, it's been a pretty cool privilege to be a part of this group and to be making this event today. And I'm really excited. So thank you all for joining. All right, so um, again, thank you to our esteemed core members. Um, we wouldn't have this event if not for everyone who kind of collaborated in the diaspora committee. So um, if everyone could give like virtual claps for everyone here, um, love that. Um, so anyways, ISC, to give kind of a little bit of context on what our org organization is about. It's basically a coalition of Iranian student groups across California. And we're basically onboarding a plethora of organizations as we currently speak. And so um, ISC has a series of different committees. And so one of them is the Iranian Diaspora Committee. And so this community essentially helps to promote Iranian culture and the humanities and arts as well as the social sciences. And so the premise behind that is to expand the boundaries of what it means to be Iranian while also curtailing kind of the art artistic side of it, right? Um, especially when it comes to going back and looking at nuances within our culture. Um, I say this as a bio major, which is very interesting. I know my existence is very paradoxical um, <laughs> here in today's discussion. But nonetheless, um, I am so humbled by everyone who is here, who has joined with us today. And we will um, be presenting some of our beautiful highlights. So um, Pehma Malaz, uh, Dana Rod, Rustin Zakar, um, Yara M. Jolmi, um, Ava Lalazarzadeh, and Julia Alehu. Um, if I pronounce anything wrong, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm not infallible. Um, I have my faults as well. So please correct me at any moment in time. Um, obviously, my pronunciation tongue is not the best. 
list. Um, but nonetheless, um, really enjoy having everyone here. And so for our first speaker for today's event, we have dear Pei Manjun. And so Pei Manjun is actually the managing director at Pars Equality Center. So Pei Man has worked on a number of initiatives. So he's basically actually worked to make sure Iranians fill out the census. He actually started a campaign with um, uh, KRRN 670 while also getting Iranians like Tara Grammy and Bita Melanian to join as well in terms of getting Iranians to make sure that we're represented in the community and we're not just cast to the side. So thank you so much for your work, Paimon Jun, and um, the floor is yours. Talk a little bit about yourself. Sure, sure, sure. Um, can you guys hear me? Perfect. <clears throat> All right, it's kind of scary, but I'm gonna jump in the pool, yeah. <laughs> um, it's an, uh, truly an honor for me to be here. Thank you so much, Farzana John, Melissa John, Leila John, Nicola John, Ariana John, and Bahar John for inviting me. And of course, thank you, ISC. Um, I'm thinking ISC, it's uh, truly, truly, it's doing an important job. And even though that it's just got started to do, it's doing an impressive and influential job. So I produce and congratulate all of you guys for initiating this organization. Um, today, um, for my talk with Leila John, I'm just gonna briefly talk about uh, uh, why I got involved with nonprofit, uh, my own personal journey. Um, I'm gonna then talk about why nonprofit and working in nonprofit can be an option for uh, who, uh, those who study social science and political science here in the US. And lastly, I briefly talk about the organization that I work for, uh, Parsi College Center. Um, so, um, in her book um, on intellectual activism, Dr. Collins defines intellectual activism as the myriad of ways that people place the power of their ideas in the service to social justice. Her conceptualization of intellectual activism includes speaking truth to power and speaking truth to the people or the communities beyond the academic ivory tower and to build community. My aim by working at nonprofit organization was and is to make a community, a com communities more equitable and human place. Indeed, I believe working at a nonprofit in general can serve as a, as a tool for intellectual activism. Uh, myself, I came to U.S. Um, um, in 2004, um, and uh, I came to academia by way of activism. Um, I often say it, an activist gone academic, an academic gone activist. So uh, I had my first taste of community activism in Iran while I was a student at the University of Tehran, and then I continued uh, community activism at UCI, uh, among with some other friends, uh, we founded the, the SIGS, and uh, I'm, I'm glad that SIGS is still uh, uh, operating there at UCI. And then um, I continue, continued my activism at UCLA. Um, I founded the uh, SARF Cultural Group uh, at, UCA, at uh, UCLA. Um, the objective of SARF was to bring together scholars and individuals interested in Iranian culture and heritage and to provide meeting and scholarly discussion workshops and lectures on all aspects of Iranian work. Uh, we had the pleasure and honor to host many um, public figures and literacy uh, figures like Bahram Beizai, Hussein Gebtai Sayyeh, Hussein Alizadeh, Shahram Nazari, and many others while Sarf Cultural Group was active. Um, also, in addition to Sarf Cultural Group, uh, we uh, found that uh, the uh, Green Students for Democratic Iran in Southern California, while the Green Movement in Iran got started, and of course, uh, the, it's what it, the, the group um, activism was devoted uh, to advocacy to build community and bridge the gap between students and the residing community in Los Angeles to support Iranian movement for democracy. So now a little bit about why I got involved in nonprofit. Um, well, I got my um, studies and my graduate school in political science. And it is of note that I didn't actively pursue a nonprofit career. Like many graduate students, I was groomed to think I would and should land a job in uh, academia. Uh, working at a nonprofit uh, as not the kind of work I had envisioned for myself. I had to let go of a particular kinds of dreams and open myself to, to the unknown 
Um, now, on the other side, I can tell you that the unknown ended up being a wonderful place. Um, I'm still lecturer at the university, but I, it's kind of a mix of social activism and academia, and it's working parallel greatly for me. Uh, so the academia system, of course, as you all know, leads PhD students and graduate students in social sciences to believe that the only thing that comes after graduation is an academic postdoc, which then leads to a tenure track university position. However, the lack of job prospects within academia means that it doesn't happen all the time. According to American Association of University Professors, the number of part-time university faculty has increased to more than 50%. While these university faculty are only hired on a part-time basis, which tends not to lead to a tenured position, many are still expected to complete a full-time workload, and they are working full-time without, and all the faculties are working full-time without any of the benefits of full-time employment. Um, again, the report by AAUP also indicates that the non-tenure track positions are increasing throughout uh, academia. Even full-time faculty members can find themselves on a non-tenure track. Um, universities are hiring more part-time faculty and the length of postdoc assignments is increasing because there are not enough academic tenure track positions to support PhDs in social sciences uh, throughout the US. Therefore, it's important for students in social sciences and political science, in my case, um, to think uh, about other career pathways that are available to them here in the US. So one of the career pathways that uh, I think uh, PhD students or graduate students or students at social sciences and political science can do a great job at its nonprofit sector. Um, one of the things about nonprofit is that uh, it's usually is not that attractive for students. Well, first of all, uh, it's the, the term of nonprofit. Uh, the term of nonprofit suggests that you wouldn't be, get, you wouldn't be getting paid. That is not true. <laughs> so according to pay scale, median salaries for nonprofits range from 50K to 63K, and ZipRuder is seeing salaries as high as 121K. Um, this easily can uh, be compared with the starting uh, faculty positions in universities. Uh, it's the, the gap between, between two is not uh, that much. Secondly, all social science uh, students, graduates, and PhD students have uh, communication skills, critical thinking, leadership, project management, and of course, research skills. As political scientists, in my own uh, personal experience, uh, I was hardwired to conduct in-depth research and critical thinking. Therefore, working at nonprofit, I use these skills to learn about the problem I want to solve or greatly improve then discover what are the issues, who are the major players and stakeholders, what are the unanswered questions, what kind of change do I wanna make, and where, where can I position myself to make that, that difference that I envision. These aforementioned skills are critical to work in nonprofit and to be an intellectual activist and to do advocacy. And by advocacy, I mean, uh, advocacy work uh, help others by supporting the cause of communities, groups, and or individuals. In sum, uh, the, US has seen a, the US has seen a huge growth in nonprofit sector, organizations that are not part of the government, government, but which are oriented to serving of social cause or public interest. Because nonprofit organizations tend to address important public policy issues and often engage with the government, a political science education offers an ideal gateway to carriers in the sector. Now, I just go to the last part of uh, my brief talk and talk about Pars Equality Center, the organization that I work for. Uh, Pars' mission is to catalyze social, civic, and economic integration of immigrants from Persian-speaking and other, country, other countries into American society. Uh, Pars has two different departments, social services and immigration services. Our social services anchor the mission of Pars and are an integral component to overcoming many of the barriers faced by newcomers and ensuring self-sufficiency. Recent immigrants often have few or limited resources and need community support in order to establish themselves in this country. Um, some of the services that PARS provide in, in its social services program are um, 
ESL program, computer classes, assisting navigating the social and medical system, assisting with tax uh, preparation, other services to improve the quality of family's life, career pathway, financial assistance, case management, and in our immigration, of course, as the immigration implies, um, FARS provides free or low cost uh, legal immigration services to qualified individuals, education services, which includes uh, in-house and mobile workshops, seminars and roundtable discussion on immigrants' rights, ICE arrest, detention, police stop, um, right at the borders, and other know your rights issues concerning immigrant communities, and advocacy efforts, which includes bringing lawsuit at national level with other Iranian American organizations challenging discriminatory immigration policies, including the administration's uh, travel ban, which I hope that it ends too. <laughs> um, uh, some of the achievements, of course, and I uh, conclude uh, my talk with that. In the last four years, PARS offices are recognized by the U.S. Department of Justice uh, Office of Legal Accreditation Program um, to provide immigration services. PARS is recognized by, by IRS to provide free tax services to low-income community. PARS ESL program recognized and partially funded by Department of Education Adult Education Program. Um, PARS citizenship classes and uh, citizenship services are recognized and again partially funded by United States Citizenship and Immigration Services. Um, FARS is official partner of the state of California, was official partner with the state of California uh, in census 2020 of course and also uh, this um, last uh, election uh, to encourage the community to vote and PARS is chairing the Refugee Forum of Los Angeles in this current year. Year uh, until uh, 2021. Um, I think I passed the time. <laughs> so thank you so much again. Uh, I'll be here for a while. If uh, any questions, I would be happy to answer. Again, it was a true honor for me to be here. And thank you again. Um, um, I'm sorry, I had a technical problem. Thank you again, ISC, for your kind invitation. And uh, again, kudos and congratulate. Uh, to all of you guys for doing this. Thank you. Thank you, Paymon, for your wonderful, wonderful work. And it's so inspiring to hear all the things that Paris has been doing and all of your achievements and your pathway to get to where you are. Um, so since Paymon Jun, you are leaving a little bit earlier, um, you mo will most likely not be able to get to the Q&A portion at the very end. So we were thinking we would give a couple minutes for anyone within the audience who has specific questions for Paymon to go ahead and uh, send them into the chat and we will ask them of you. Otherwise, I do have some few questions for you. So if anyone has any, please go ahead and send them into the chat now. Otherwise, um, one question I have is that community service and uh, activism, you know, is a lot about making connections with people and those interpersonal relationships that that you have. Do you have any um, memorable experiences or memories um, that stand out to you with the connections that you've made with the people you've helped? Oh, sure. Absolutely. I mean, uh, as, as you mentioned, the uh, uh, interpersonal relation, making connection and networking, it's, uh, it's instrumental in working at nonprofit organization. Um, as I just, uh, just a couple of, just couple of uh, examples that uh, come, come to my mind. Uh, it's the, the census 2020 that was just passed. And since it was mentioned uh, during the introduction, uh, so as you know, uh, we Iranian and Farsi speaking are a large community here in Los Angeles. However, uh, on, in numbers and on paper, because of census and census uh, 2010, uh, Iranian and uh, Farsi language is not an official language here in Los Angeles. Um, because even though that we know that we are, lots of us are here, and even though that the officials and the county and the city knows that the Iranian community is a large uh, group here in Los Angeles, however, on paper, we are not that much because uh, our community didn't participate in 2010 census or because of many political reasons, uh, they didn't answer and introduce themselves as Iranian on the uh, census. Um, so um, one of the things that uh, through um, 
interpersonal connections and also networking we could do um, with uh, some Iranians uh, who are working in city of Los Angeles in the mayor's office and also in county officials. Uh, we could just uh, ask them to translate um, all of the materials into Farsi uh, because even though that the census doesn't show that the Iranian group are not uh, uh, large, as large here in Los Angeles, however, because of the political influence that those certain people had in the body of the government and the local government, uh, we would be able to do that. So. Uh, just uh, connections, networking, and interpersonal relation, as you mentioned, uh, play an instrumental instrumental role in advocacy and this kind of work. Thank you, Pei Manjun. That was uh, incredible to hear how much of an impact uh, PARS has on the census and the importance of that is, is really uh, instrumental to to all of the work done. So I appreciate that. And we thank you again for joining us for this panel. Thank you again. Um, I'm, 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 and I'm sorry I can't uh, be here until the end of, on the end of the session, but uh, the session is getting recorded and I'm, I'm gonna certainly watch it after <laughs> later on. Thank you again. All right, so now for our audience, we are going to move on to our next wonderful guest speaker, and that is Yara. So Yara is actually, if you guys didn't know, he was a, or he is, I'm saying it in past tense, like it's already happened. Um, so Yara is a AJ Plus producer, host, and also a journalist. So he's actually educated a lot of Iranians themselves on the nuances within our community and kind of shown that we aren't just a monolith of people. And so if you've seen his series, Becoming Iranian American, you've kind of seen, hit, seen him highlight um, sort of the ins and outs of being an Iranian in what we sort of call Tehranjalis, right? So um, really check out his work. And if you guys didn't know, Yara has won Webby Awards, the James Beard um, Media Award, as well as some Shorty Awards and more as well. Um, those are just a couple. So Yara, the stage is yours. Thank you, Fazana John. Uh, cool. So I'm going to try to share my screen because I very dorkily put together a presentation. Um, participant, but no legit name means annexation. So I mean, not annexation, um, exclusion. There we go. Yeah. All right. So let's try this again. All right. Fingers crossed. I'll do that. All right. Well. There's a little bit of a, okay, great. Anyway, so this is the presentation I put together. Um, it's kind of like a brief look at uh, what I've done and hopefully from that we can you know, draw some conclusions and hopefully I can give some, any advice that I may have to young folks looking to pursue careers in non-STEM fields. And so yeah, I titled it How I Learned to Stop Worrying and Love Making Weird Cat Videos. And that will make sense as we kind of go forward. Um, so let me just kind of explain how I got to where I am today as like a video producer, host, and editor at AJ+, Plus, um, which is Al Jazeera English's kind of young millennial digital branch. Um, uh, first and foremost, like in college, uh, what did I do? I knew I wanted to be a journalist, um, just, you know, much to the chagrin and dismay of my parents, who obviously had other designs in, in mind. Uh, so uh, this is kind of me in college. I took every opportunity I could, um, you know, as, as opposed to high school where I was kind of still unsure, to do journalism as much as I could. So here I am interviewing someone for the school newspaper. That was a, a very, well, that's a whole story in itself, that individual. But uh, here I am learning Persian uh, in class because I knew I wanted to move to Iran after I graduated. I wanted to somehow kind of cover Iran from an angle that I didn't see covered very frequently uh, in the kind of American media and so forth. And then here I am doing an internship at Al Jazeera English uh, with my colleagues, uh, Ben Moran and Kath Turner. So in college, it was just like all speed ahead, like any opportunity I could take, anything that came my way, I was like, yes. Even if it wasn't directly what I thought might be, you know, what I want to do exactly, I took it as a learning experience and just jumped in it kind of, you know, with my eyes closed, kind of like jumping into a freezing cold pool. And then post-college kind of, I was like, okay, so the thing I want to do is I would love to go to Iran and kind of really act on this impulse of mine to, again, cover Iran from a perspective I didn't see very frequently reflected in the American media. The Iran that I had grown to know and love and kind of understand as a young Iranian American trying to find my footing here in the United States, right? I would see certain things about Iran that I wouldn't see again, uh, that my friends, for example, in high school and middle school wouldn't quite understand. So I was like, well, what can I do to kind of amplify those stories and those voices? 
So um, I moved to Iran and kind of my main goal in that sense was to write. So I wrote whatever I could with the context that I could make. I studied Persian at the University of Tehran's Institute in my spare time. I, I wrote for The Guardian, I wrote for Time Magazine, anyone who would take a freelance article. And I wasn't employed by any of these people. It was just, you know, writing, 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 any story I could think of come up, I'd pitch, you know, a lot of them would get shot down. There's a lot of moments when, you know, I was just, I lost hope and confidence. You know, stories will get shot down, ideas will get shot down. And they did repeatedly. Um, but, you know, I, you know, lo and behold, eventually something would get approved and, and that would learn, you know, lead to an article. I would get paid practically nothing for these things. Um, and that is also reflective of the privilege that I had uh, to live with my family in Iran and not have to pay rent. So I live with my grandmother. I live with my other grandmother. I live with my aunt. So it was very much for me, you know, I, I was on this mission of like mom and dad do not support me in this industry, in this field. They would much rather have me be a business person or a lawyer, you know, all the standard things, or a dentist or a doctor or a scientist or a computer engineer. And I was like, you know what, that's fine. I'm going to live with grandma. I'm going to write. I'm going to continue writing. I'm going to continue interviewing people. And um, yeah, so basically that's, that's what I did. And so this is one of the pieces I was very proud of. I wrote about the state of journalism uh, in Iran right after the election of Rouhani. It was kind of a, you know, people thought things were going to change for the better, but then some things did not. And so it was kind of a middle of the road picture. Some things are better, some things are worse. Anyways. But then again, all opportunities I took in stride, right? So it wasn't just me writing, but it was also me, you know, being offered opportunities to translate and teach English. So somebody offered me something at, uh, you know, during kind of the opening that happened of Iran after the Rouhani administration started to reach out to the West and the United States. Uh, the TED uh, TED Talks uh, sort of saw an opportunity to host an event on Kish Island uh, uh, off the coast of Iran in the Gulf. And so I um, I was brought on as a translator, a volunteer translator. I, you know, initially my gut impulse throughout much of my life had been to say, ah, should I not do this? I probably shouldn't do this. It's not exactly what I want to do. But you know what? I said yes. I hopped on a plane. I went to Kish and I live translated something I was definitely not fit to do. Um, but I did it because they requested me to do it and they asked me to do it and they said, we want you to do this. And I'm like, okay, fine. And it ended up going okay. So another thing I photographed people, you know, again, there was a project called Humans of Tehran. At that time, there was a lot of talk of war with Iran. Um, and this was, what was, when was I taking these pictures? 2013, 2012, stuff like that was happening. So me and a, co a couple of colleagues um, had started, well, a, co a colleague of mine had started this page on Facebook based on the Humans of New York page that was very successful and spawned all these different pages across the world. And Tehran and Iran was one of them. So uh, looking again here, I'm gonna take photographs. This is another skill that I did not have, but I, I just played around and, and I took photos and here they are and, and hope to kind of paint a more human picture of Iran as a lot of media figures were talking about war and kind of dehumanizing this country of 80 some odd million people. Uh, then eventually uh, someone offered me a job. I fell into some groups and uh, I got a job at an animation company. And that again was not necessarily in my in my direct kind of route to journalism, but I was like, you know what, this, this, the company was presented, I don't know if I can play this video. Okay, great. So this was, uh, this is an Iranian animation company. They made a very stunning piece about um, basically what happened during the Iran-Iraq war when Saddam Hussein, you know, deployed chemical weapons on innocent Kurdish people and civilians. And, and I was just blown away by what they did. So I took that as a day job and continued to write um, during at the evenings. You know, this was like my ability to kind of take as many opportunities as I could, do as much as I could do, um, but still continuing that sort of passion focus on, on writing and journalism and so forth. So I even wrote about my time working at a company in Iran. Um, and then, you know, I had some fun as well. And this is another thing, you know, always on the side, whether it was writing articles at night or even at the, jo at the job that I had at the animation company, it was very much like, what is my passion project? What am I working on on the side? And this is something that I've had all throughout everything I've told you so far. Uh, you see things that don't necessarily fit within the sort of line of, of, you know, journalism, print journalism, what have you. So I ended up taking one of the animation characters, which was very popular in Iran. His name is Longi. It's named after the outfit that he wore. And I would just basically. Hello, everybody. Welcome to Lightning Bird. I'm going to show you around. So I'm going to put my finger on this machine and check it into the beginning. Anyways, that's something I haven't shared with, I don't think, anybody. But anyways, here it is for all of you you to see a side project that I pitched to the company as a way to grow their social media presence. Um, but whatever, it was, it was um, again, a kind of a little passion project I worked on on the side. Anyways, after a while, two years pass, 
um, I decided to move back to the United States, uh, and I'm very confused because you know something bad had happened in Iran. Jason Razayan, the Washington Post correspondent, somebody that I looked up to, was arrested and detained by the Iranian government, and he was someone whose path I very much wanted to follow. And I saw kind of what had been happening even during this opening. So. I kind of took that as kind of a warning and kind of got cold feet a little bit. So I moved back to the States uh, sometime afterwards and um, basically got a job at this public relations company. I'm not going to name, but um, was like, okay, maybe I'll give up journalism for a bit and see what that's like. And I was very unhappy um, until one day I told my boss, who's this wonderful Syrian American woman who had worked at the UN during her earlier years. And I was like, hey, I'm confused. I, I, you know, I'm working here. This is not necessarily what I want to do. I'm a journalist. I want to do journalism. She's like, you know what? You're still, you know, you're in your 20s, you're young, do it. You know what, now's the time to do it. So go back to your passion, try it, keep trying, don't lose hope. And she was the, she was, she wanted to keep me, but she also wanted me, you know, she was very, very lovely. And, um, uh, and so gave me this great advice. So I applied to AJ Plus, uh, which was based in San Francisco at the time. And um, I didn't think they'd accept me, but uh, after a few weeks, uh, my print journalism experience, I guess, was something that they found interesting. And so I fell into AJ Plus and started making news videos. Um, very much excited. I was just like, I couldn't believe I'd gotten this job. I was so excited to just put together any news videos, the ones you see with the text on the screen that pop up on Facebook and Instagram. That's what we were doing back in the day. A lot of, a lot of the time, we're still doing it today. So I was sitting, this is me behind my computer, assembling things on video editing software, all these skills I learned on the job. Again, I was a print journalist by training. Um, so some of the videos that we made, a variety of different topics, like this was a very inspiring one for me. Um, but very, very, you know, straightforward news videos. <laughs> So yeah, and just a variety of news videos would come at us every day. We quickly covered them. The videos did very well during that time when Facebook was pushing them. And then slowly, again, kind of picking back up on some of the things I would do earlier kind of uh, during my career, whether it was uh, print journalism in Iran, um, I did, I'm going to skip ahead uh, to this. I also worked on passion projects, you know, always on the side. So I had these assignments every day. Uh, and whenever I could, if I had a 30 minutes left over at, at the end of work, or if I stayed, you know, for a few extra minutes afterwards, I'd work on these little projects that I personally, you know, received a lot of uh, validation and fulfillment from. And that kind of came through the video editing I got to do and the weird stories I got to tell. So I found this, this may be a very polarizing video you guys might watch, but um, I found this, uh, one of the passion projects was about a man who turned his dead, he found animal carcasses and he turned them into drones. So this was... My own cat, Orville, got killed by a car. Uh, I decided to turn it into a drone. As a tribute to his untimely death. I had no idea about remote control helicopters or anything. So anyways, that's just one example. Um, very strange, very far cry from what I was doing around as a print journalist. But again, I'd fallen in love with video editing, the skill I learned on the job. And, and telling quirky, weird stories was one of my passions, stories that had weird editing like that, that I would edit together myself. And the other passion projects was, again, I managed to find something that gave me a lot of fulfillment as a print journalist and apply it to AJ+, which was kind of helping explain Iran to other young millennial and Gen Z Americans, right? Like, what is the Iran that I know? A cultural kind of story. So I did a piece about, you know, Abbas Kiarostami, for example, the celebrated Iranian film director, um, when he passed away. So there was that. I did a piece about an Iranian video game designer who finally decided to make a video game about the Middle East that didn't involve guns and explosions and warfare, which is something we very frequently see uh, in the world of video games with Call of Duty and all this shooting and killing. And there's even one video game where they invade Tehran, and that's quite, um, that's quite scary for a lot of Iranians who are living there. So again, I wanted to tell other stories from other angles, portray Iran in a way that I think a lot of Americans perhaps may not have seen as frequently. And of course, you know, the cat videos, the lizard videos, the Kyoto Stami video, the Iran videos, they performed very well at the company. And, and this one, the cat video did like 57 million views. It was nuts. And um, so that kind of allowed me to, I built some sort of understanding with my managers and they sort of started to trust me. 
uh, with my weird videos, with my Iran videos. And that eventually led to kind of this documentary series that we did about Iranian Americans uh, in LA. And then we interviewed my family in San Francisco. And this is again, another passion project. The opportunity came up. I sort of had built the trust of my managers to let me kind of host this thing, right? So I've been assembling a lot of news videos, occasionally hosting, but this was a fully hosted kind of show. And the piece, the three, the four documentaries that we put out in this series did very well for AJ Plus and were shared by many members of our community, Iranian American community. So then that kind of laid the groundwork for me to eventually kind of start a show that I was very passionate about myself, which was one that looked at the intersection of food and social justice. And that was kind of, you know, social justice was a theme that we, we looked at a lot at AJ Plus and, and food was a personal kind of passion of mine. I did a lot of cooking, brought lots of food to the office for my colleagues and for myself for lunch. And I was that awful person who put the food in the microwave and just, uh, you know, just distributed many, many fumes uh, everywhere. Um, and so that's what the focus of our show was. Uh, Eat This with Yara started with my colleagues, Tavish Talib and Adrian Blaine. And, and uh, we were very privileged and blessed to, uh, you know, the people watched the episodes, some of them went viral and we won some awards. And yeah, so I mean, kind of long story short, if I could wrap everything up, um, I don't know, I think I'm within my time, I'm not sure. But um, yeah, it's basically, uh, so in terms of STEM fields, right? So I think some, something to say, is, first off, STEM fields are great. I'm, I'm gonna be, maybe I'm, you know, I think they're great. It's, it's a fantastic career choice if that's something you're into. That said, with non-STEM fields, uh, oops, there is no direct career path, right? There's no, you saw my, the whole point of me telling you this weird meandering serpentine circuitous kind of story of me going to Iran and doing journalism in college and, you know, translating and working in an animation company and all these things, they may seem disparate, but, and, and that's kind of part of it. There's no direct, you know, single one shot path to, I want to do this, right? I started this company at this company that I'm working at now, AJ Plus, as just a news producer, right? Uh, I had hopes of eventually maybe doing something more, but my kind of goal in that moment was to make news videos. And I did them the best that I could, and I tried to find ways to be creative while doing them. Tried to find ways to incorporate my passions, whether it's staying a few extra minutes or coming in early and doing that. So I think, I think something to remember is that there's, you speak to anyone in my industry at least, and it's, it's not as common to have that direct shot to like, oh, I did this and then I fell into it from my experience and people I've spoken to. Um, the other thing I'd like to say, maybe I can summarize this, but you know, always be doing something, right? Uh, err on the side of saying yes. And those two are related, right? It's, 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 you're going to be thrown a lot of opportunities and a lot of things that might make you feel uncomfortable, right? I've never done this before. I don't think, you know, you might have, uh, what's that, um, I need that word, uh, imposter syndrome, right? This is not me. I, I don't know. But, but I would still say uh, it is imposter syndrome. So take that in stride, right? Take everything in stride, say yes. You know, you know, of course, if someone's at, if you're like, you know, doing journalism and someone's asking you to, you know, fix a car, then it's very, very different. I mean, you have to be able to distinguish, right? Like, I'm not a mechanic, I can't fix a car. But, but for the most part, take those opportunities in stride, even if they are slight deviations from exactly what you want to do. Because at the end of it, it will be a learning experience, right? You are going to, I learned many things from uh, the animation company when I put together those weird videos with the action figure, I was doing um, uh, video editing, right? And that video editing, the very mild limited video editing I did there eventually came in to help me during my interview at AJ Plus, which was a video job and I was a print journalist. So they're like, you don't have any video experience. And I'm like, I actually, I do have some, uh, right? So there was that. Um, everything is a learning experience. The cat videos, the lizard videos, our food show incorporates a lot of fun editing and humor. And I got a lot of that. I tested a lot of that and trial and errored a lot of that through the weird cat videos and the, and the animal videos that I used to make. Um, the other thing is to keep working at it. I think what's very interesting is that working at the PR company, I saw a lot of folks who had sort of lost interest in journalism. They're like, oh, I tried this once and I failed. And so I just gave up journalism and, and moved to PR. Fine. That's, that's also a great move as well. But but the thing is, you are going to fail many times. You're going to have emails unresponded to many, many times. You're gonna reach out to your idols, to people that you really, really admire. You're going to put out pieces and articles and videos that don't do well and no one shares them and no one watches them. And then at some point, uh, you know, you will, you know, something will eventually happen because I, in my view, I think a lot of people lose interest. And if you just kind of stick to it longer than a lot of other people, <laughs> Um, the chance of you, I mean, there's that kind of element, but the other thing is that eventually you will have your moment um, because it's all about diligence and all about continuing to kind of like, you know, chip away at, at what it is that you want to do. And then lastly, again, again, uh, all skills are valuable. I kind of mentioned that about taking everything in stride, any sort of deviant experience uh, might eventually 
work its way into your life, but passion projects, right? This is an industry where, again, there's no kind of like, oh, I took this MCAT test and then I got this job and then I got that. It's it, in, my, in my humble view, I, I don't think it's one, again, it's not a straight shot. It's not take this test, get this job, you have it, you're in it. Um, so you do have to kind of, in a sense, like work on things that you're passionate about. A lot of this industry is driven um, by passion, you know, it includes a lot of passionate people. And whenever you can at work, if it's, if it's you have some time off from your, you know, your main duties, you finish early, try to think of something that motivates you, right? And that's, I think, what's going to produce some of your best work and hopefully get you to wherever you want to be. Um, so yeah, I hope, I don't think I went over a few minutes, but um, yes. Uh, and, and then the last slide, I don't know. I tried to enjoy what you're doing. That's the most important part. If you're pursuing a non-STEM field and you hate what you're doing, uh, that, uh, that would suck. So <laughs> just, this is me having a sword fight uh, in Tehran at the Golestan Palace. Um, it has nothing to do with my job, but um, anyways, it was just a, a picture that resembled uh, reflected enjoyment. Um, yeah. We learned a lot from you, Yara. And I think um, one of the most introspective things is being able to understand that difficulty is something that is unavoidable and using that to your full capacity to propel you forward. That's truly important. We've seen that in many you know, parts of our lives. <laughs> We've seen that in today's um, Zoom conversation, mm -hmm, unfortunately. Yeah. But um, with that uh, being said, we love your commentary, we love your work, and we are just so honored to have you today. So another one of our esteemed guests is um, Ava Lalazarzadeh. Um, Ava, actually, um, I had the privilege of going to high school with Ava. Um, I so know. Very lucky. With some coincidence of fate, I was able to be with this wonderful human being. Um, but Ava has actually um, starred in a number of films with prominent Iranian um, actors such as Navid Negavan, uh, I'm not going to say this right, but uh, Mojan Marno, if I'm pronoun my pronunciation's on fleek, it's really not. Um, and she really stands as a representation to the Iranian community of how you can enter the arts and be an actress and pursue your passion. So Ava, the stage is yours. Um, go right ahead. Hi, Farzana. Thank you so much, ISC, for having me. And yeah, Farzana, we actually went to high school together. We were on the speech and debate team together. Uh, I'm a year older than Farzana, so she was there three years and I was there four. And then you finished off after I graduated. But yeah, we were the definitely the only Persians in our high school. Um, and yeah, right, Farzana? I think it was only you and I. And I think that's so interesting that we were the only Persians growing up in a community where we were minorities, but I think that we really, both you and I had such a strong sense of self that we really found our niche and we found what we loved to do. And we had a community of people and especially in high school, a, a team and a high school speech and debate team that really supported us and um, fostered our, our talents and our gifts. So yeah, my name is Ava and I'm an actress and a filmmaker and a poet. And I just graduated from UCLA this past June and I'm living in Los Angeles right now. And I'm pursuing being an artist and continuing making my own work as not all the work that the reality of it is, is as an actress, not all of the work that you get paid to do is work that you're particularly deeply, deeply love. So I really encourage artists and especially um, people of color and minorities that work isn't necessarily mainstream represented to really dig deep into your own authentic voice and create passion projects that fully represent and articulate what it is that you, your unique self, have to offer to this industry and to this business, right? So um, I was, just a little bit about how I got into acting is I was really young and I always really, really loved it. And I had this deep passion as a young kid. And my parents, being Persian Jewish, they're in STEM fields. My mom's a psychologist, my dad's a doctor. They saw that this was something that I was good at and this is something that I enjoyed. And so they really fostered and put me into programs that, that enriched and nourished this passion that I have. So I think for a lot of um, high school students or younger, whoever may be watching this, even if there's parents on this call, that if you have a child that has a gift and if you have a child that is showing interest in this, to really 
put them in positions that's going to help them grow to be them their best selves to help them grow and foster this this talent that they have because it is a respective field and it is something that you can grow up doing if you're in a supported environment it's all the more easier if you're in a supportive and supported environment um so yeah i think for me so much of what i do now as an artist and as particularly a filmmaker making my own work is using art as a form i know paymon said this and yara said this as a form of activism and social justice i think we have such a unique perspective to share as iranians and me and julia julia is also my roommate she's a panelist as well we're both iranian jewish and so we also have a unique perspective to share and that we in our blood in our roots in our dna we're poets our our language is poetic and our language is in metaphors and we know to our bones what it is like to go through a revolution our stories our history our blood is is of a people who were persecuted and and who uprooted and came here and built a life for themselves so we know coming from family who have been through that we know what that is like in our bones so we have important stories to share and we have a unique tone to to offer and to represent to people and you know not to give attention to what happened earlier but it's a perfect example in this microcosm of the zoom panel how those people exist and so it is all the more important for us to empower ourselves and empower one another to use our voice to talk about these kinds of issues and and to share our stories and our perspectives so that we can humanize ourselves so that people are no longer allowed to be blind and willfully ignorant to 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 that kind of behavior right you no longer can uh can can put swastika stickers up when when you know the jew sitting across from you right um so so yeah i know fazana you maybe had some questions do you want to have a little bit of a dialogue back and forth and i'd love to open it up and if anybody has some input i'd love to incorporate it in and have all our voices be heard yeah so um you talked about having that support in your community and in your family specifically. How do you feel like that's kind of contrast to a lot of Iranians who grew up in like communities where their mama and baba say, Farad, doctor, lawyer, ba engineer. So how do you see those Persians kind of developing and what sort of advice would you give for them in yeah. following their passions? Totally. So I'm, um, ever since I graduated, and I'm also an acting coach and I'm a college audition coach. So I, I coach people who are auditioning for drama schools. And I have an Iranian student right now who's in Australia and that's his greatest struggle is he's, he's, an, he's an economics major, a first year economics major in college, but he's also applying to a drama school right now, really without his parents' support. And I think what that creates is is a lack of confidence in yourself to really be able to pursue this craft. It becomes hard. Um, yeah, it becomes difficult and you kind of have this cognitive dissonance in your head. But I think what I would say to that is you have to know, you have to ask yourself, what are your values? You know, are you going to find more value in going down a path that's more steady and stable for yourself? Is that more valuable to you? than going down a path that is more uncertain and does have more anxieties because you're not going to necessarily know where the next paycheck is going to come from. Um, but is that a more authentic path for you? If, if you can, if it would be, it would it be so much more harmful to not follow that because it is your passion and your gift and your love. Are you willing to give that up? And if the answer is no, and you're going to be super upset and unfulfilled for the rest of your life, then I think you need to find either you need to fully invest or you need to find some middle ground to where your, your, your voice and that artistic side of you is still being represented. Um, but what I will say is I think the idea that most conventional Iranian parents have in their head is that this is a career that is incredibly unstable, that we can't make it, that it's one in a million, that you're Iranian and those stories aren't being heard.
just a few months ago, the Academy of Motion Pictures created this five-year proposition to include more um, MENA. Oh, it says my internet connection is unstable. Can you guys hear me? Okay, to create more voices for people of color and for MENA artists. So like, you're, so if within the next five years, if a, um, you want to be a Oscar contender for the best feature film category, it has to have a supporting role or a lead role be a person of color or a minority or somebody of the LGBTQ community plus community. Um, so there are these propositions and, and rules sort of being put in place to really swing the pendulum the other way so that our voices can be heard. So this idea that we're not being represented and this idea that, that we're not going to have an opportunity is simply untrue because we are showing up and making those opportunities for ourselves. So let's, let's not adopt this learned helplessness mentality that we can't do it because it's not there. We're a group of artists sitting right here at this table. We are at the table, you know, and, and we can do it and we have to put our foot in the door. And if there is no door, then it is up to us, our community, and many Iranian actors, such as Navid Negapon, has opened that door for many of us to step through. I was 16 years old when I met Navid, who is a dear mentor of mine and has opened so many doors for me. Um, we met at my grandma's house and my grandma made gondi for him, this Persian Jewish uh, turkey meatball dish. And, you know, he helped me with my college auditions and, um, the short film that I was in with Navi Farzana and Mojan was, I was in Lo London, I was in Oxford for this summer acting conservatory, the British American Drama Academy, and Navi just happened to also be there. And so we grabbed dinner one night and he said, you know, I'm in London um, and I'm shooting this short film and I gave your headshot and resume to the director and they're writing a small part for you in the film. Can you change your flight because and and stay a week longer because the short film is shooting a week after you end your program and so to to yara's point that was a moment where i had no idea where i was what i was doing i had to change my flights and i said yes i said absolutely yes and i got the script and i learned my lines and i prepared and in a week i was on set and every day i went there um, and because the circumstances were a little bit unusual, I went there every day and I PA'd also. And then on my day as an actor, I acted. And now I um, have a really great rapport with the director who is so sweet. His name is Daniel Jewell. And this summer he wants me to come on and be an assistant director for the film that's now being turned into a feature film, right? So uh, not to like clout or anything, but not to brag or anything, but, but just show, to, to that extent to show to Yara's point that when you say yes, when you put yourselves in opportunities to be seen and you really put your best foot forward, you will be seen, you know? And and you, you, you'll be seen for what you want to be. I'm not just an actress. I also do love to direct. And I love to have um, a voice in other aspects of film. And somebody saw that. And I'm lucky enough to be validated for that in this particular instance. There's been plenty of times where I haven't been validated for that. And I've had the door slammed on my face. But this is an instance where it worked out, you know? That was absolutely beautiful, Ava. And I knew um, just from high school meeting you, I, I told myself that girl is, she's going to be successful. Um, it was just so evident. Um, if you guys ever get a chance to see her acting, it's um, phenomenal. I, I can't express to you how beautifully she portrays characters. It's almost surreal. Um, going on to someone in the same realm, we're going to move on to, I'm going to be quick. Um, we're going to move on to um, Julia. So sorry, there's a little bit of echo. So I might have to move everyone back and forth because sometimes I don't know if there's an echo on your end. But anyways, we're moving on to someone in the same realm, which is Julia Alehu. So Julia is also kind of working alongside with Ava um, in terms of film production. So Julia is a cinematographer and director at Adolescent Productions. Um, she not only creates plot lines around the Iranian community, she's also created plot 
fault lines around other immigrant communities and kind of help to outset um, the voices of people who have paralleled experiences um, with our community as well and who share the same burdens and um, just the type of tribulations that we have in our community. So a couple of her featured um, films are Lily's Journeys, Yasmin, um, Celine and Simon, and then um, the one that she is filming along with Alba right now, which is currently, I don't know if it's done with production or yet, they can tell us, I don't know if it's allowed, but it's a uh, winter of 79. So yes. Hi guys. Um I am Julia, as she said. Uh, thank you so much for having me here. It's really exciting to meet all of you and so special. I mean, Ava and I know each other and we, we're actually roommates and um, collaborators, but it's so special to hear all of your stories and journeys. And yeah, thanks for having me. Um, so just to jump into me, um, Growing up, I actually grew up in San Diego, California, also similar to Ava, like one of the few Iranian people in my community. So I kind of, I'm, sh I'm sure a lot of you who didn't grow up around a lot of Iranians can relate to this. I, I had a tough time fitting in with, you know, everybody else and kind of finding my culture and who I was within a community of people who, you know, I was kind of different from. So something that always kind of helped me navigate that was the arts. My mom from a young age actually put me into, you know, an after school arts program and encouraged me to, um, to pursue art. Um, and I'm one of those lucky people who my parents really did encourage me and kind of as well saw that fire in me and decided to push me more towards that rather than telling me to do something more practical. Um, so when I went to high school, I was a part of an after school film conservatory um, where I made Lily's Journey and Celine and Simon. And yeah, the first short film I ever made was a documentary about my family member's story escaping Iran during the revolution and her pottery career because she's a potter. Um, and, you know, I submitted that to film festivals and saw that it did well and saw, you know, that this story really affected people. And I said, okay, this is what I want to do. And for me, going into the arts was not, um, you know, I was actually kind of between going into the arts and film production, really going for it or pursuing, you know, entrepreneurship. And I decided ultimately to pursue film because I wanted to tell stories that I thought were important. And those stories started with my family's stories and they started with my, you know, Iranian culture and my Iranian background. So um, those were the stories that I really wanted to tell. So I went to Chapman University um, and I uh, had got a degree in film production. I just graduated. Um, and one of the first independent short films I made was Yasemin. Um, which is based on my mom's story moving to the States in 79. Um, and it's kind of like a cute little funny story about an 11 year old Persian girl in LA who has a unibrow and she navigates, you know, assimilation and trying to find her way through, you know, this issue of her unibrow and getting bullied and, you know, all that. Um, and, you know, I, this was a really tough project for me to make because it, you know, involved finding, you know, Iran, young Iranian actors who could speak Farsi. I had to get a classroom full of about 30 child actors. I had to get, you know, other people who weren't Iranian to help me make this movie, you know, shoot it and edit it and, you know, work on it together. So that was something I found really special was I was pitching this story to people who were not Iranian, but they somehow also, you know, were so drawn to it, were so interested in it. And I thought it was cool how, you know, people of different cultures and backgrounds can ultimately relate to that feeling of other. Um, so um, I actually did have a bit of backlash, not from my family, but the backlash I got was from my professors. Um, I shared the script with a couple of professors and um, one in particular told me, Julia, are you planning to uh, make this film this summer? If so, let's have a meeting in my office. And I thought, oh, I'm so excited. He loves my script. He's gonna like help me out. And so I go to his office and he tells me, listen, like if you're trying to make this script, like you should wait till your senior thesis. There's no way you can pull it off. There's no way you're gonna find a bunch of Iranian actors. There's no way you're gonna be able to make the main characters unibrow look realistic. 
you know, he had a list, laundry list of reasons why I wasn't going to be able to make the film. And I said, you know what? Forget this guy. I'm going to make it. Um, so that summer I made the film and that's actually how I met Ava. I uh, randomly messaged her on a casting website. I messaged all the young girls who had an Iranian sounding last name. And I said, would you be interested in acting in my short film? Do you speak Farsi? Um, and Ava responded and she's, she's one of the main characters in the movie. Um, and that short film was actually one of my success, most successful shorts um, that I've made. It was, it got into the AFI film festival, which is a really, really awesome film festival in LA. And um, it was a really special thing to be a part of. So since then it kind of validated to me, okay, people do want to hear these stories. People are inspired by these stories and it's not only Iranian people who are interested in hearing these stories. Um, so as I continued with film, I knew like my next big project was going to had to be centered around, um, you know, my background and culture and specifically my family stories. And like Ava said, being a Persian Jew, um, my family, you know, experienced, unfortunately, some difficulties during the revolution in 79, as I'm sure many of your families experienced. Um, and we had to escape the country. And so I said, I have to make my thesis film about this, you know, my family stories escaping Iran. And I had heard, you know, pieces, bits and pieces, and they always, you know, amaze me. And they always come out in those quiet moments around the dinner table when, you know, you start getting deeper and deeper in conversation. And then somebody eventually feels comfortable enough to share this really intimate and a lot of times like really sad thing that happened to them. Um, and so I heard bits and pieces like that. And I decided, you know what, I'm going to pursue this. I'm going to sit down with uncles and aunts and family members who I knew had really incredible stories to share. And I'm going to get their stories. So that's what I did. I sat down with um, my uncles and aunts, one of my uncles, unfortunately, who was put in jail in Iran, um, other families who unfortunately were executed in Iran. Um, and I got their stories and I wrote them down and I pieced together this 20 minute short film. Um, and it was going to be a challenge. It was a movie that is set in 1979 Iran, but of course we were filming it in LA. So that was a big challenge is turning, how do we turn LA into Iran, especially since I've never had the privilege of actually traveling to Iran. Um, so it was a lot of, you know, you know, finding old photos, asking family members and really piecing together this image of what 1979 Iran looked like, especially during this like, you know, crazy time in history. Um, so um, we were lucky enough to pitch the story to, um, to a organization at my school that gave us a really nice grant and we were shooting the film in March. And in the middle of production, <laughs> COVID hit and we were shut down. So we filmed three days and there's a total of six days of shooting for the film. We, we filmed for three days and then we were shut down and I was just crushed, devastated. You know, it's like the story we had worked on for over a year, you know, story that's so personal and so, you know, it's so special to you. And we were just shut down and I said, you know what? despite having graduated in a horrible economy and whatever, whatever, like my main focus is going to be finishing this movie. And I think that's like something important for a lot of artists to remember is like any obstacle that comes your way, you can react to it two ways. You can either shut down and say, well, forget it. It's fate. It wasn't supposed to happen and move on. Or you can say, you know what? This is a, this is an, problem that can be solved and I'm going to keep pursuing what I'm passionate about and what I love and what I know is important. So that's what I, um, you know, did. And I, I didn't just sit around and wait, uh, for the movie to be made. I emailed my professors every week. What can I do to finish this movie? How can I, you know, make it COVID safe? What are the rules I have to follow? What A, B, C, D, E, F, G. Um, and so 
for, you know, seven months, it was this back and forth with my school. And finally, um, my producer and I came out with a bulletproof game plan for a COVID safe set. Um, and we finally convinced our school to let us shoot it beginning of October. And it was, it was not easy, but you know, when you have that passion driving you and when you have that intuition telling you, listen, this is something that you need to do, you know, there, even a challenge like COVID is not going to stop us. And in a three day shoot, we got our whole cast and crew COVID tested two times. We, you know, we did temperature checks and this and that. And uh, it was just, you know, crazy amount of work, but I'm proud to say that we finished shooting the movie and we um are now in post-production on it so i hope to share it with you all when it's finished and i hope that it inspires you and affects you in um positive ways um and i guess going off of what yara said just if i can give like a piece of advice to other young artists out there who are deciding whether or not they want to pursue you know a career in the arts or if they want to go a more practical route is don't wait like you know if there's something you want to do do it like and don't let anything be an obstacle to you and don't let you know don't make excuses for oh i can't do this yet because i don't have enough money and this and that you know, something my grandpa always told me is, if there's a will, there's a way. So my piece of advice to everyone who's watching is find that way and do the things you love to do. And if that means that your day job is something in STEM and you come home at night and you write your short film or you write your novel or, you know, you do that passion project, then do it, you know, pursue, pursue what you love, even if you have those obstacles in your way. Yeah. A thousand percent. <laughs> Thank you so much, Julia. And I really think all of our eyes will be glued when um, Winter of 79 comes out. We are all looking forward to it. And we have no reservations about telling our friends, our family about it, because Thank I really you. do think um, um, just from seeing the graphics that you guys posted um, on the pictures, it looks like it's curated beautifully. And I, based on your other productions, I'm sure it is. So. Thank you. Yeah, so, we are so thankful to have you um, and for you to speak at our event, um, especially if you are an Iranian at this event today who is really, you know, looking into you know, pursuing like cinematography or acting or anything within that realm that's artistic that portrays, um, you know, a certain character or a certain story, then please um, don't be afraid. Please go for it. Oh, so, and another thing, too, is if there are any other filmmakers out there who want to reach out and uh, shoot me a message. Don't be afraid. Uh, just, you know, find my email and email me. A thousand percent. So moving gears a little bit, we're going to go to a wonderful writer we have today. Um, Dana is here with us today. So Dana is a writer and editor and a poet based in the Bay Area. So um, they basically uh, work on Raider Productions web blog um, and also on creative nonfiction pieces. So um, they're of um, Iranian and queer heritage, or I was going to say queer heritage, but that's technically not correct. Um, queer identity. So being at the intersection of different identities, um, Dana has basically gone toe to toe with helping to fight against um, the misleading information that you know mainstream media has provided. I really do believe that um, they have amplified the voices of a lot of Iranians that maybe are in the same predicament that have family circumstances or social circumstances that they might not be able to overcome. But reading a piece that um, they have orchestrated has probably propelled them to maybe you know shift their boundaries a little bit and be more comfortable with their identity. So Dana, the floor is yours. Hi everyone, thank you so much for having me. I am um, not gonna lie, I was kind of affected by the Zoom um, this the happening earlier. So I just wanted to take a deep breath and just kind of ground all of us together. And I love how we all just like kind of moved forward and still made our magic happen. <sighs> 
So my name is Denna Rod. I'm an editor, writer, and poet based here in the Bay Area. I did not start as that in my college career. I was initially pursuing um, a pre-nursing curriculum at San Francisco State University. Taking the prerequisites for my programs was like chemistry, statistics, anatomy, physiology, things that were not in my wheelhouse, but I was really trying to make it work and make it happen. Um, I wasn't playing to my strengths and and it showed despite the efforts in my studies and through a confluence of factors um, and fall sophomore semester, it led me to declare English literature the next semester because that's what really made me tick and it fell in line with my natural skill set. Um, my parents definitely weren't pleased at the time <laughs> um, because they're like, wait, you're going from not some, something STEM to something humanities based and they just kept seeing the dollar signs. And for something for me that I think that has been really important and that has, I think, kind of intersected with like my um, queer identity is that sense of needing to be authentic to oneself despite what the circumstances are. And I really found that um, in my studies when I discovered Audre Lorde. Um, I felt passionate enough about her work to pursue a master's degree in English literature at San Francisco State. And I was initially aiming on a PhD path. Um, like Paymon said, though, there is a dearth of jobs in academia. Um, my graduate advisors were telling me how, you know, their students from their PhD programs were competing with their graduate advisors to find tenure track positions. So it wasn't necessarily a sense of like, this is like a good bet. And I did actually end up taking um, paid work outside of the academy after my master's thesis was completed. Um, I wanted also my work to have more of an audience and it tends to happen when you're an academic, your writing gets siloed within the academic audience just in the way that you're writing. Um, it can be very dense and erudite and that can make it inaccessible to the people that you're trying to reach. I was writing my um, thesis on Homi Baba's theory of third space enunciation of hybridity in the post-colonial context and applying that to Audre Lorde's work. And I was realizing that as I was writing in this language, it was really inaccessible to the people that it was actually about. And that was something that I felt really strongly about. Like I wanted to make some sort of a difference with my words. And even though I worked in like a slew of unrelated day jobs to writing, I always had the passion project on, in the back of my brain on the side in the sense that even though I was, you know, selling lipstick at Chanel at Macy's Union Square, I was still thinking about how all these like systems interlock together that kind of led to someone walking through the front door, traveling from like a different um, country to get a sense of what was like American or getting a piece of that Americana. I was always really fascinated by those interlocking systems of power. And I was really surprised to be drawn to poetry um, because I was initially starting to write a YA novel um, in the fall of 2016, and then the poetry kind of kept bubbling up in front of me, and which I thought was really interesting because poetry tends to be linked to being Iranian. And I didn't know this at the time, but my Baba Bazar, my grandfather in Shiraz, he apparently would always be reciting poetry in the town square um, to people just walking by, and people would stop and sit down and listen. And I feel that's almost like kind of cliche to be like, you know, per, like poetry is in my blood, but I really do feel that in a certain way because I didn't choose writing. I really did try to ignore it for a long time and kind of force myself in these different boxes that I thought were what I needed to be acceptable. And I tried to ignore my natural strengths when I initially declared pre-nursing. And ultimately looking back, I was always writing stories in the margins of my course notes and finding ways to imagine what was in front of me to something more fantastical. Um, and through that, I was really fortunate in taking on a few projects at the time um, in around 2018, where I had my first essay published um, in an anthology, and that kind of really broke open the world for me and having the sense of 
finding that opportunity, like Yara was saying, I applied for a residency at the James C. Hormel Center, which is an LGBT archive at the San Francisco Public Library. And I got paid to go through the archives and ended up finding these newsletters called Hasha, um, which is Farsi for Denial. And it was written by these queer women in like the early 90s, only two issues from spring 1994, summer 1994, where they talked about, you know, writing in, they had, they were all wrote under pen names because they couldn't write under their real names because they were too afraid of being outed and losing their connection to their Iranian communities. And then once they started finding each other, there were like these big bursts of light and how they were like, we have to write this down. And I still haven't found who these women are, if they're still around, if they're alive, because they wrote under pen names. And so that was one of the reasons why I felt really strong about writing under my own name so that people could find me. And also a name like Dena Ra doesn't sound very Iranian. And so as a result, for better or for worse, I have access into certain spaces that perhaps um, a more Iranian sounding name wouldn't grant me into because I look white on paper, but they get the gay Iranian <laughs> when I show up. And so with um, those newsletters from Hasha, I was fascinated because they wrote about the Gen the specific targeted campaign of genocide for LGBT Iranians um, during the Iran-Iraq war. And that wasn't actually brought to light until like 1996. And I didn't learn this until like 2018, so only a couple years ago. And that led me to writing um, my poem, um, Hadith, or Traditions for the Closet, where I, I wanted to take all of those facts, all that information of all of the names I don't know, or all of like my queer and trans ancestors who I don't know for so many circumstances, and try to give them an homage in some ways. And when I was growing up, I didn't know anyone else who was also queer and Iranian. I honestly thought I was the only one for a long time. And that also kind of drew me to, to writing that down and having this sense of making sure that my story would also be documented because I read, you know, so much Iranian American literature in like 2015, 2016 with, you know, Azadeh Muavani and, you know, like reading Persepolis and it's just trying to find some kernel of myself reflected back and not finding that and honestly feeling like, okay, this is where I need to move forward to because if I can't see it, then I have to be it. And then that also provides a path for the people behind me coming forward. And that was something that I had to really kind of come to terms with my parents because they're very private people. And I said, you know, I wanted to write about us. I wanted to write about our stories because one of the reasons why I decided not to move further into academia when I was in graduate school was that my childhood home was foreclosed on. And just kind of having that sense of like, oh my God, like I don't know where I'm going to live. And that kind of immediacy of needing to find that next step of what you're going to do next doesn't give you too much of the luxury to create art. So once I had this space to kind of move away and have the space to recover from that, my dad was like, you need to write our story down. You need to write down what happened to us and let people know what's going on. And there was this sense of urgency that he was telling me that he was also to like tell my story. And so that's going to be like a goal that I have later down in my um, writing career to like kind of write down the family history, whether for publication or just for my own posterity and archival archival needs. Um, and it took me a long time to really accept that, you know, the, what Yara was saying, not that it's not a linear path from going to school to get a job. Was that's what we think about, you know, you, you take, you know, the GRE, you get into grad school, you get your degree, you get a job. 
with humanities, it's, it's, it's really more what you want to do. And it took me a long time to accept that I got my education because I wanted to be educated in that field. I didn't get my education because I wanted to get a job in that field. And I am really fortunate because I just paid off all of my student loans as of this month, still working my day jobs and working on my passion projects. Um, I, right now, my... I'm writing that YA novel that I had on the back burner for the last four years because poetry took over my brain. And my first book of poetry will be published next year in May by Milk and Cake Press. And I'm also working um, to put together an anthology um, with Radar Productions, which is a queer literary nonprofit based in San Francisco. The same, um, same um, organization that paid me to do the archival research at the James C. Hormel Center, um, also paid me to go on tour this past spring with Sister Spit before, you know, COVID um, shut it down. And this year is the most money I've actually made from my art because I was able to take on passion projects that didn't pay because I had another day job. And being able to take on those passion projects that didn't pay was able to build a foundation that would allow me to get to the place where I can apply to take on paid work, I can apply for grants and be able to make the most money from my art this year due to like chapbook sales, due to touring, as well as like speaking and reading at different organizations and nonprofits. And I think what you want to you know, kind of like sell your parents <laughs> if they're worried about why you're switching from one career to another or if they feel like you're floundering is we have this idea of the myth of the self-made artist that we kind of spring forth without anyone else influencing us. That's certainly not the case, at least especially in writing. Like you need other people and you need a mentor. So finding a mentor in your field, if that's like my one piece of advice, we look to the person whose career you admire, whose career makes you jealous, that you're like, oh, I want that, but I don't know why I want that look to that person, find their trajectory, see if they're willing to sit down with you, have a Zoom call with you, maybe compensate them for their time and their knowledge and see what you can learn from there. Because I'm only here on this panel today because of those who came before me in writing like Persis Kareem and Jasmine Darznick. And it also goes to say that if you have the information to show to your parents, like, hey, here's my research. These are the annual salaries to the people in my field. That's not a lot of money. I'm going to go do this instead and do this on the side. And I will totally be real with you. My mom says my writing does not matter <laughs> because she says my day job matters more. But at the same time, she told me that when she reads my writing, she's able to see me in a way that she hasn't been able to before because she can only see me as her child rather than a fully realized adult. And so I think that there's something to be gained from forging your own path and to also have that sense of accepting that you may not necessarily know immediately what you're gonna do when you graduate from college. You might take a job that has nothing to do with your field, but you can still lay the brick down for a path that you can follow to something that will ultimately lead to the best of both worlds. That was phenomenal. Um, I am just, I'm still immersed in those words. Honestly, I keep reiterating them back in my head. And what you said um, was just um, enamoring. So I think everything that, you know, our panelists have said thus far has propelled us to all be in this motion that don't be stagnant you know, always be spontaneous, always do what makes you feel the most happy um, and don't compromise yourself for anyone. So thank you to every one of your wise words. I, and I'm sure all of our, you know, audience here today really appreciates it from the bottom of our hearts. Um, so with that being said, we do have one final guest speaker today. Um, we are gonna run over time 
really want to punch that Zoom bomber to Mars. But um, in any case, um, just to get, give you guys kind of like a quick perspective with the Q&A and everything, if our you know guest speakers would choose to do so, they can stay until um, the end of the hour, if that is possible. If not, you are welcome to go because obviously this meeting is designated until 6.30, so we won't keep you guys, but we would really love for you to guide, uh, to stay until, um, you know, probably seven o'clock PST. Um, we do have one more speaker as well. So we have the amazing Rustin Zakar. Um, so Rustin is actually a Middle East and Islamic studies librarian at UNC Chapel Hill. And so he basically analyzes um, the kind of ins and outs of the cultural, social, and political trends surrounding not only Iran, but also Central Asia, as well as the Caucasus region, which, um, hooray, Caucasus. This is a Persian blue. Um, <laughs> so Rustin has a very interesting identity in terms of his studies. Um, he actually has a PhD from um, NYU in Islamic studies. And he also has an MA from Harvard in the same exact field. And he is pursuing his education even further as we speak right now. So Rustin, the floor is yours. Um, tell us a little bit about yourself as the social science person in the room today. Sure, uh, thank you so much. Um, first of all, I just want to say um, a couple things. Um, I just, I apologize for being late. I came in um, a little bit um, after the panels, uh, panelists had already started. Um, my three hour trip from the mountains uh, returning turned into a nine hour trip because the roads were closed due to a landslide. So um, I immediately jumped in and uh, tried to follow up with, uh, with everybody and with the conversations that are being had. So. Um, another thing I want to say is um, I never thought I would experience this, but um, I've never been in a space with this many Iranians in before, like other than like, let's say a Mehmuni, but um, just seeing all these different Iranian faces and names um, kind of, you know, like got me nervous, but also just like was really cool to see. And I'm glad that uh, the Iranian students of California are like putting this on. And I think this is a really great conversation coming from a family that, uh, my older sister is a doctor and my younger sister is a uh, lawyer and my father is an engineer. So like, um, I, they really hit the, the trifecta. So I'm, I'm the, the black sheep, I guess. Um, so I'll just um, kind of get started um, a little bit about, oh, also one more thing is that everybody's just so supportive in the chat and like, honestly, I've never seen anything like it. So you guys are a great group, um, fantastic. Uh, and just wanted to throw that out there. Um, so, yeah, just a little bit about um, what I do and how I got here. Um, so I guess like a place to start is like, I, I assume like all of you um, growing up, born here, or at least first or first or second or second 2.5 or 1.5 generation. Um, I was born in the States, um, but I moved around growing up a lot as a kid. So I didn't really have too many Iranians around. Um, usually like if we were, like let's say we were living in Fort Collins, Colorado, my mom would be like, oh, like I met this Iranian in a grocery store and like all of a sudden we have to have a Mehmuni with them or something. And then turns out like, oh, okay, they're kind of weird. Like maybe we shouldn't go and hang out with them that often. But um, always kind of searching for that, that um, uh, uh, cultural connection was very big in our family because you know um, the only thing we really had was like our nuclear family and then going back to Iran. And we were fortunate enough to be able to go back every summer. So for me, I guess like um, my identity was really kind of about trying to understand where that came from. And a lot of my career choices kind of came out of trying to understand that identity and also like moving beyond my identity and creating new and forging new identities and um, finding things that matter to me beyond being Iranian. Um, not to say that, that shouldn't be 100% of what you're interested in, but you find other, <laughs> it's good to find other things as well. So I guess, um, yeah, like I, I, I want to kind of, when I was younger, I wanted to be an archeologist. Like I really was fascinated with like ancient Iran and like Persepolis and all this sort of stuff. And so like I studied, like, you know, I tried to like learn Egyptian hieroglyphs or like cuneiform and um, that did not go well. Like there's a reason why people study decades to like learn how to read dead languages. Um, but uh, what really kind of changed my career path was uh, 2009, um, just kind of being in college at NYU, uh, doing, um, I was originally going to be um, in the cultural anthropology track, but when the green movement happened and just like watching what was happening in Iran just kind of really affected 
what my interests were at that time. So like I kind of shifted from ancient history to like uh, studying politics to uh, switching to Middle Eastern Islamic studies. And from there, I, I just kind of was just interested in like trauma and intergenerational trauma and understanding like how I got here, how did my parents get here and the different historical narratives we have about that. So like, you know, what my parents would say um, would be a vastly different story than what I would read in a history book or a textbook and like understanding that, you know, diasporas create narratives and they think certain ways and not all of those are, let's say, you know, historically accurate or even like, let's say, um, a good, a good uh, <laughs> rosy picture of, or maybe too rosy picture of the past. So um, kind of from there, um, I was interested in studying the Iranian left, kind of as I was like, I was trying to make sense of like, uh, like how, what happened, what, how, like where did things go wrong? And so um, also my, my, my father, my mother's side and my father's sides were like, they're both kind of like leftists in the revolution and hearing them kind of talk about um, their failures and like, you know, how they regret certain things and me like not understanding that or not un like understanding where they come from and having sort of a more um, historical sort of perspective about like, you know, the revolution and what was happening before, those sorts of things kind of um, compelled me to like have to prove my, like, and I, obviously like what would happen would be like, my parents would be like, oh, but you don't know our story, right? Like you don't know half the stuff that we tell you, like you think you know, but you don't, right? And so like that sort of experience of always being, um, having like your academic knowledge be challenged by the personal experience and, and realizing it took me a decade to realize that, but like those are both valid and actually like can help each other and are very important. And some scholar, some scholarship actually includes all of that. Um, but that kind of took on a new project um, when I went to Harvard for my master's and I was still doing Middle Eastern Islamic studies. And there I kind of met a bunch of like-minded graduate students like myself and it was during, you know, the Arab Spring, it was 2011, everybody was talking about global revolution, it was Occupy, and we we're just like, yeah, like, you know, we feel it, we're, we're, we get it, like, the world is going to change, and this sort of stuff, and we want to be a part of it, and we want to have these sort of discussions that we're having about Iran, like, uh, to be out and about, we want to talk to our parents about it, we want to talk to our Iranian friends who are in STEM about these sorts of things, and from there, we just kind of, like, the three of us, as graduate students, we just started a blog, and like to be provocative, we called it the Agile Media Collective because we're like, oh, like that word, like what does it mean? And, you know, as we kind of studied more, we're like, oh, Agile like actually has a lot of different meanings and is used in so many different contexts. And, you know, and so it was just like something to kind of be provocative, but also like uh, to really use that space of, you know, other to kind of explore different topics that we're interested in, things that didn't really fit in with our academic studies. And it was basically a glorified blog in 2011 and over the years just kind of grew and um, we started writing more stuff. And some of the earlier stuff that we did was like uh, specifically geared towards our community, which was like, oh, like how do we talk about Persian ethnocentrism? How do we talk about blackness in Iran? How do we talk about, uh, you know, the, our historical narratives about 79, right? So these sorts of things, like we were writing and we were getting a lot of feedback, not always good, not always bad, but like that sort of stuff became um, really important for us to kind of keep going. We're like, okay, this is great. People are reading us like trying to, you know, dispel how people view, you know, nationalist myths of Shahnameh, which is like, you say that to your grandparents and you know, they'll probably have a stroke or something. So don't, don't say that sort of stuff, but like, um, you know, so the, um, the, uh, the question is the, you know, like we kind of just kind of moved on uh, producing some of this work and, it's some like these blog posts kind of just got longer. They got more articles. We were starting to get more people interested in working with us. So like we ended up having more people join and we started, you know, getting scholars who wanted to write for us, journalists. Um, and we really kind of ended up realizing that this project could be a place that we could really explore and do the things that we, we maybe were afraid to do in academic settings. Right. Cause I'm sure as some of you know, if you're thinking about grad school, if you're kind of no friends are in grad school, like uh, the pressure of getting an academic job is like requires you to, to kind of change your behavior of how you write, how you talk, how you act, right? You're, you kind of build a certain persona that is, you know, 
oh, I want to explore this one thing, but actually like, I don't want to share my materials yet because somebody might steal my work, right? Oh, um, this is a really great article I want to write for this newspaper, but you know, actually this should be a peer reviewed journal so it can go towards like my, per my CV, right? You start to kind of think about these calculations about how to, you know, go into this professional field. And we kind of want to change Uh, I think his internet connection. I don't know if it's the same for everyone, but um, he yeah, might. Yeah, him too. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's frozen. It looks like. We'll give it a couple seconds, and then hopefully Rust and June can um rejoin super quickly. Oh yeah. Yeah, um, if you guys have any questions for any of the panelists for the Q&A portion, um, please type them in right now. Um, we'd really appreciate that. Um, also, your participation is so, so um, welcome today. I am so happy that so many of you guys stayed um, after the time was over. I hope you continue to stay um, for the Q&A section because I think we'll have some really interesting responses and seeing like the back and forth between the panelists. I've learned so much already, um, but I can't wait to learn more. So. Um, yes. Uh, rest in your brain. Yeah. yeah, for some reason my internet just like decided to stop working. Um, but I'm gonna wrap it up. Basically what I want to say, um, so I, I feel like the Q&A is more important, um, but uh, all, these, all these different projects that we kind of started doing through Adjam, like we were doing podcasts, we were doing, you know, short films, we started doing mapping projects, and we just kind of as a team collaboratively we were like oh like we want to learn how to do this stuff so you know we went to youtube university we just started googling like uh youtubing how to do this one thing how to do this other thing and the next thing you know we just kind of developed this sort of project that you know people seem to like and a lot of people seem to really not like but we're like that also helped me kind of deal with my own sort of insecurities about what i put off uh, put out online but I think what I want to get at here is that that passion project ended up actually getting me my job, right? Um, what I have now was that um, I had a friend who was like, hey, like, you know, I nominated, like there, were, there was a listserv about like this position opening up and I like, I love what you guys are doing in Adjam. And so like I, I wrote to them, they wrote to me and asked me like, and then I wrote back and I said you. And so like I applied for the job and I got it. and. Uh, basically, like the things that I do in librarianship, we can talk about later. Um, but uh, a lot of collection development, donor relations, uh, archiving, endangered materials, this sort of stuff. But um, when I went into the job talk, um, it wasn't my dissertation that was like showcased. It wasn't my name. It was Ajam Media Collective's homepage, which was like up on the on the uh, the projector. And I was like, wow, like this is something that I had no expectations was going to turn into something that would actually get me somewhere. Um, so I, I don't want to take up too much time, but I just want to kind of channel what everyone has already, all the other panelists had already said, which was like, understand that, uh, you know, your pet projects or your passion projects, like these are things that are going to define you, right? You're going to create, you're going to put all this different, you're going to find time for them because like, that's what's going to make you tick, right? That's how you're going to feel like you're a productive person and that you're engaging with the world. Um, also understand that your interests change, right? Like, so um, I'm less concerned about Iranian revolution now. I'm more concerned about like Imperial Russian customs regimes, like, <laughs> you know, like something totally opposite. Like, um, and also like, I, I guess like the last point I wanna make is that we shouldn't also disregard collaborative work. And I think about all the sort of things that we have done as a team for the last 10 years, like, I, we, I could not have done it without them. And to like realize that being in, 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 in you know, we're, we, it was a glorified email thread for a long time, but like having that sort of space where you can fight with each other about ideas or, you know, think about something and argue and disagree and, and uh, collectively work on a project, like that is something that, you know, I don't think any, I could have ever learned that in the way academia is traditionally structured. That is something that like has really helped not just improve my own writing, but like the way I think about what is possible. So, you know, as we're thinking about like non-STEM, as we're thinking about, you know, our trajectories and our professional development, also think that like, you know, it's not just you, right? 
like having a good team is going to be like one of the most valuable things to you. So just think about, I don't know, just think about your projects as not just your projects, but you know, you, you, you can find like-minded individuals that would be happy to do them with you. So I'll just, I'll leave it as that. And we can, we can talk more in the Q and A. Awesome. And it might be cliche to say, but um, truly the, you know, the pen is mightier than the sword. And so I think um, seeing the superheroes that act behind the scene, um, writing with the pen and showing and curating these stories, these experiences is amplified. Um, as everyone um, kind of saw, no one knew that Rustin was um, one of the co-founders of Adam. So seeing that response from a lot of members in our um, organization today really kind of talks to the effect that it has on the community. And this is just like one sliver of its effect as well. So um, moving on, we're gonna be going into a Q&A portion. Um, for everyone that is in attendance today, either you can unmute yourselves and you can ask the audience member, or if you're not comfortable talking, you can always you know, type your question in the chat and we can always redirect it to um, our fellow audience, or fellow audience, fellow panelists. Um, and as always, if our panelists have any questions, they can also um, direct them to other panelists as well as the audience too, if they wanna get like a certain question out as well. So yes. So I actually have one question for the panelists. So, um, Y'all were talking about the theme of, I guess, like rejection, like rejection from like your families, rejection from, I guess, people like along the way in like your career and everything. And basically what I was just wondering is how you all um, got past those feelings. What did you all do to take care of yourselves and ground yourselves and move past that feeling and move on with your careers? I can start for that one. Um, as a writer, you're constantly submitting your work to publishers, to journals, to anyone who will publish it, like any, like anyone, and nine times out of 10, it gets rejected. So you have to build up a really thick skin and kind of separate like yourself from your work as like a, cause like this product that I made isn't myself, which is really difficult when you know, the type of writing that I do is like, I'm writing about myself and writing about my experiences. So it can be kind of difficult to tease that apart. But the way that I would recommend to kind of circumvent that is like almost exposure therapy. Like the more you do it, the easier it gets. Um, my book was rejected from at least like 90% of the publishers that I submitted it to, but I just needed one. I just needed that one acceptance to get it out there. And that makes all the difference. And I think that as long as you have your people around you to like kind of build you up when you get those rejection moments, and it's like, you kind of like lick your wounds for like those like couple of however many days or hours you need to, and then like just pick yourself back up and keep moving because it's, it's really about just kind of keep moving forward so you can build that foundation that you can build off of. I actually have a question for actually all the panelists can actually answer this one. So like Yara mentioned how he like lived in Iran and um, it was, I think, Julia who said like she'd never been to Iran and then there's, um, you know, like Rustin who's been to trips in Iran and um, of course like Abba and the other panelists, I'm not sure like how often you go or not, but do you think that your trips to Iran have affected your personal view on like your career now? Or do you think that if you didn't make those trips, or if you did make those trips, would that have shifted um, your decisions? I mean, well, I think if I could, I can kind of uh, take this in part. Um, yeah, I think it, it definitely, uh, for me, I had a lot of curiosities about what I wanted to do and the paths I wanted to take in my career. And, you know, I think being able to go back to Iran, first and foremost, I recognize that was a privilege that, you know, you know, some of us have, and it's definitely something, you know, that I recognize as such. Um, so it did allow me to extinguish some things that I wanted to do or things that I did not want to do. I could then rule out and be like, okay, I've gone to Iran. And also parts of my own identity, right? Having grown up as an Iranian in the United States, Iranian American, hyphenated person, however you want to kind of call it ethnically. Um, it's it's kind of like 
I aspired to this thing. I had, I felt like I had to be this or I had to be that. And, and, and I think living in Iran alongside other Iranians who are my age, making friends, working, taking, you know, commuting to work in the same way that Ali Reza and Mariam and Abbas and, and, you know, Leila in my taxi, we share the taxi every morning with four, three or four other random Iranians. Uber pool was happening in Iran and it's way cheaper than here before Uber pool happened in the United States. Um, anyways, but yeah, and it was like that sort of, I don't know, we have a word in Persian, I don't know if it's ogde or like, there must have been a vacuum inside of me, like there's some khala, as they say in Persian, a, an empty spot. And being able to kind of see it and feel it and be like, okay, I know now what this is. I know now what I did not have in my life. And I know how much, I know my relationship with that. And I know where I belong in that. And then I come back to the United States and I'm like, okay, good. Now I have a better sense of where I fit in the spectrum. Uh, had I not had this privilege to do that, I think I would have still been longing for some things and yearning for some things. And it's just nice to know what it is. And I think in any sort of identity discovery journey, uh, this sort of feeling and experiencing something firsthand is, is a very welcome privilege. And so, yeah, I would say identity wise, yes. And then career wise, I did kind of learn again, the journalism thing, right? Do I want to be a print journalist in Iran? Well, uh, you know, friends, colleagues, acquaintances, I saw things that happened to them and things that I was not personally brave enough, honestly, to take on. So I found my own place, moved back to the States, and I started producing cultural content to talk about Iranian Americans history or talk about, again, Iranian video game designers, Iranian fashion design, like things, cultural things that I, I hoped would open Americans' eyes to people in our community, in the diaspora at least, through characters in Iran that I would remotely be in touch with. So there's also a career element as well. Okay, that's uh, great, guys. I'm just so excited to be here. Like, thanks to Bahara that actually just passed me the link, and I'm just like so excited. That was such a cool community and so positive and everything. Um, so I'm not in California. I'm joining you now from Miami, and um, I'm doing my um, PhD um, in um, cultural and linguistic and literary studies. I work on uh, performance and social media, especially among Iranian users, but I got here after <laughs> getting two degrees in engineering, um, the last one in Italy, so I did my master's in engineering in Italy, and then I was like, I was like, to my parents, I was like, you know what, I'm done with it, so I used to work in theater when I was in Tehran, especially like all the time, like I, I was like, I university of Tehran doing engineering, but I was like doing theater, theater, just working with, um, directors back there in Tehran and then I just came back to what I like so um, although it's a little bit more theoretical um, the practical aspect of it with COVID is just a little bit like you know but um, I'm so happy doing this so what I basically started doing was that on my Instagram like interviewing and talking to especially immigrants um, Iranians that they decided to change their way and come to non-step kind of fields so I just found this talk very like you know inspiring and so like parallel to what I'm doing and what I'm trying to show to the others that you're not going to become badass or whatever if you don't go to STEM or engineering or Dr. Mohandas or whatever so yeah but um my question to you guys is that so I'm not a second generation but I um noticed that a lot of you are so I wonder if you've ever like except from Yara that has been like in Iran and just you know uh, have, have some experiences in some parts of the and talking to some Iranians, but I wonder if you've ever shared your work, like your films, I don't know, Ava, Julia, and Rust in your research, especially that wonderful Ajahn project that we all read it here. And I wonder if you've ever shared your work, if you have any part of your audience from, um, you know, people of my age, people in their 20s or 30s or something, but not second generation Iranian, you know, like actually those Iranians who are in Iran and who are like all the time online. Now we know how people are doing in Iran, how like I know what, what, what people in my age are doing around the world. I wonder if you have narrowed down and noticed that if people in Iran actually are sharing the same perspective as you do in your artistry or in your cultural research, um, uh, just to hype on that, I actually, funny enough, um, uh, another Iranian filmmaker who's older than me and is from Iran 
who she she's a grad student at AFI, um, reached out to me and saw my short film Yasemin, and it was really cool to connect with her because you know, me, like you said, being second generation, like I actually didn't know that many people who grew up, uh, who were my age and grew up in Iran. So it was really cool that she like saw my short film and actually like, you know, connected to it. And then she herself was an as aspiring director and filmmaker. So I think like the cool thing is, is that, you know, no matter where we are and like what generation we are and, uh, you know, whatever our families have been through and experienced, like there's always this base level of connection and like this base level of among at least like artistic people, this intuition of like, you know, this is what I have to pursue and I'm going to go for it against all odds. So that was cool to see in someone else from, from Iran. Cool, Julia. That's, that's pretty lovely. If I can also uh jump in on this question i think i think uh you know there are certain when i think about the ajan project i think that a lot of it especially the early work was very much informed by our position in the diaspora and we and we shouldn't pretend that it was anything other than that right the types of subjects that we were choosing and the sorts of conversations that we were informed it like i you know i think back to this um uh you know, some of the earlier work and like, especially this one that we, you know, the, the three co-editors, we wrote an article about, you know, how people kind of use Shahnameh and Ferdowsi as a nationalist myth and the sort of comments that we got back, you know, like um, even things that we were inaccurate about, I'm like, oh, like, but you know, the fact that we were taught those things by our parents or by even Iranian professors in America, like that means something, right? And I think that like that sort of work was very clear to me that like there that in fact I don't want to erase this this boundary between you know being born in the U.S. and um, and um, recognizing my position here. Whereas for example, my co-editor Alex Shams, I'm I'm sure some of you follow him on Twitter. Like he's made he's made like um, he's somebody who like has gone back and like has decided to live in Iran and you know he's worked with Iranians for Ajam. Like for example, he worked with. Um, we were invited to do a, a, a Biennale in, uh, in Karachi. And so he actually worked with a bunch of Iranian um, friends and colleagues and collaborators to actually go to Pakistan and put on a project about, uh, you know, Pakistani-Iranian relations. So like that, I think like in terms of our individual, like where we are as individuals within this larger collectus, uh, collectives, like allows us to work in different contexts with different people. So for me, like I, because of you know some security concerns that we had when one of our co-editors was in Iran, I haven't been back to Iran since 2013. But as opposed as opposed to that, like I thought, like oh my career is going to end, I'm not going to do work on this. I made a shift to work in Russia, so I spent three years in Russia. Like I was mostly in um, you know the Caucasus as well, so Azerbaijan and like in in Armenia and Georgia. And so when I was there, um, I just found. Iranians there that I could work with, surprisingly enough, but also like, you know, realizing that, uh, you know, that sort of the sort of conversations that we're having, like there, um, if it's not a translation issue, like there are plenty of people who are working on similar things. And it's just a matter about finding those people and like working with them. And some, some of us, for example, Alex is much better at that and towards like vis-a-vis -vis Iranians than I am. Um, but I think that's what gives us strength, right? Is that like we have people with different interests who are doing different, different stuff. And, but yeah, to, to agree, like, I just want to emphasize that uh, I, I'm very cognizant of this, of this division and I do, I do not want to erase it, even though we do have some similarities and some sort of, uh, you know, connections and we speak a language, um, but yeah. That's yeah, cool. Rustin, you said something that like kind of sparked, I really resonated with what you said is like being very cognizant of the fast fact that, you know, you are one layer removed from the homeland, so to speak, and always growing up for myself and thinking I'm Iranian, I'm Iranian. And then one day my parents go, you know, you're Iranian American. And I was like, what? And, and having this weird dissonance in my head, like, I never... I guess what I associated with American in my elementary school brain was white and going, well, I'm not that. But then 
as weird as this sounds, coming to the really fully fledged coming to the realization that I'm so much more American than I realized was in the process of writing my my feature script about my mom's immigration story right now and trying to write nuance of this mythical landscape that I only know through secondhand stories and Google Maps really, really pr reflected itself to me how much I am disconnected and don't know from, from Iran and that although I am Iranian, I'm actually so far removed from, from this place where, there, where there's more of me. So I think that's like a really weird kind of like dichotomy that I'm recently only a few months in have experienced and I'm experiencing as to I have so much more to learn if I am going to write stories about Iranian people, not from an Iranian American perspective, but from an Iranian, from my mom's perspective, from a 47 year old mm -hmm. woman's perspective when she was 15 years old, if I'm going to write that story, I truly have to become a dramaturg and a historian of what 1988 Iran was not from my perspective, but from her perspective. So really, you know, doing my due diligence to be completely authentic to those characters, voices and stories. Absolutely, absolutely. We also have another question that's along the same kind of realm. So Tara asked, um, you know, how do y'all navigate being authentic and vocal in your field? So this, you know, kind of accounts for humanities and arts um, with safety and security for people you know in Iran and um, your ability personally to go to Iran. Uh, <laughs> reason why I'm um... Uh, I wanted to answer this question is because it's something that I struggle with every day. Um, just be, one of our co-editors is in Iran, but you know, um, the one of the problems that I've always had with you know working in Ajam is that we all we all have different levels of what we're comfortable with, right? So, for example, like me knowing that Alex is in Iran, what does that mean if you know we get a piece that is like hypercritical about something like very relevant like to a, a you know protest or like a, a human rights activist or something what what does that mean for us to to write about it and what like so and i think that matters because um we do get a lot of criticism about that right like what things that we choose to focus on and what we don't and i honestly don't know how to deal with that yet is something that for 10 years has has eaten me up and you can ask any of my co-editors like we'll get into arguments about like how far we want to push things that you know one of us would be like you know what i can't we're self-censoring i don't want to do this like and then at the end of the day realize like okay well what would happen if you know one if we didn't hear from one of our our editors or one of our friends for so long like how would we feel about that and and i think that has just like um kind of taken the forefront is that like you know just work as as friends right as colleagues like as people that like i've grown to love over a decade like if something happened to alex that you know happened because of some article that we wrote like how would i like how could i live with myself for that and so like it's been one of those questions where i'm like does that make our work um does that weaken our work and yeah probably it does but you know i think that that's just part of life and the fact that you know what um we have to work in these circumstances and um it's just yeah it's not everything is going to be easy decision so that's that's my two cents on that oh definitely uh, really well said and something that i've grappled with as someone who's reported from iran in iran and then also about iran from outside of iran um it's, I think you said it very well, Rustin. It's, it's, I mean, you kind of take it as it comes and you, you make those decisions, you think about the ramifications. And I guess one of the ways that I think about it, and I have not been back to Iran for five years because of certain fears that I have, you know, now that, you know, when I was working in Iran, part of my story is that you saw those articles I took screenshots of. Uh, some of them were not, you know, they were critical of things happening. <laughs> and, uh, but I wrote anonymously while I was in Iran. So my name was not on anything. And, uh, you know, there's a risk with that as well. And then when I came back to the States after living in Iran for over two years and writing and translating and doing everything, I asked my editors to kindly, I had to reach out to them individually and convince them all individually to put my names back so that I could then use those articles to get another job. So it was very much a rigmarole of like, because people didn't believe that I wrote those pieces. And I was like, yes, I did. And here's this and here's that. Um, and since I've done that, and since I've, you know, 
develop this on-camera personality, even though my work does, is not necessarily about Iranian politics. Uh, you know, I, I'm, I'm doing videos about like putting Horma Sabzi on a pizza, you know, or like doing a video about the Iranian American experience, which has, you know, I mean, sure there's a little bit of history, but it's not, it's focused more on Iranians who are living here. Uh, or hyphenated, you know, kind of Americans, in other words. Uh, but uh, even still, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm scared. So I, I personally do not go back. And until if there's a political change of some kind, uh, maybe I'll reappraise that. Uh, but as of now, yeah, I've kind of I've fallen into that category. And, and I don't, it's, it's an unenviable kind of place to be. Uh, and everyone's making decisions as they, you know, weigh and appraise their own kind of the risks and benefits and, and you know, they, there's family involved, there's, there's so many different variables that it's, it's really hard to cast like a really wide net and say anyone who does or reports or doesn't report the start, whatever, you know, it's just, it's, it's very, very complicated. So um, even with a lot of academics, you know, back, you know, when I was doing Middle East studies, I knew a lot of professors who would travel back and forth and it was very much top of mind for them. Um, you know, some professors have renounced you know their ability to go back fully others do want to maintain it because their research is based on say interviewing people in the tehran bazaar and they're not doing necessarily a piece that's talking about the supreme leaders power or whatever but it's about the tehran bazaar and they have to go interview bazaaris so how do you yeah it's it's tough it's very difficult um so i um when I made the decision to write under my name, except the possibilities that I wouldn't be able to travel to Iran, um, just writing about being a queer person. Mm -hmm. um, my parents never took me to Iran. It was always, you know, they were just very like, I think scarred by the revolution. And they were just like, don't go back. Like, just don't, don't go back. There's nothing there that you can find that will make you happy, which I was like, kind of taken aback by, but I've, honed that into my writing and like writing into that like space of not that longing for my homeland my motherland so to speak and like not being able to go there and like see the mountain that i'm named after and because i'm in my 30s now my parents told me they're like if you ever want to go to iran your 30s would be a good time to go mm -hmm. like you'll be emotionally prepared for Iran then <laughs> and I was like okay and now I'm in my 30s and I I have a little little bit of hope now with the potential administration on the horizon of that maybe that being a possibility but also I'm not that idea of writing what I want to write without fear of any repercussions or consequences is something that I might have to reconsider if that does actually become a possibility. Um, also, my, I don't know if my extended family in Iran knows that I'm queer. I don't know if that is something that my parents communicated to them because my dad said they didn't want to see all this and like just actually pointed to like all of me. And I was like, oh, okay. Like having the like haircut and like piercings apparently already marked me as like other and like Western. And he he just told me, he's like, they're going to know that you're American the moment you walk, you walk in through the airport type of thing. And like kind of really instilled this fear in me. Um, so that's something that I'm still working on. But I also think that fear it comes out of love and comes from their trauma necessarily, not from my experience. And if we, and also <laughs> I'm married to a white woman. <laughs> so if I want to go, I want to <laughs> take her with me. <laughs> and so we'll probably have to have the like state issued tour guide that like would direct us around Iran, exactly. like, Anthony Bourdain instead of like me going to like see my mom bazaar and ball bazaar with like a white American woman they'll be like no she can't come in <laughs> um and so there that's also I, I actually wrote write a lot about that in my first published essays so um that's something that I continue to explore and grapple with and there is no answer because the situation is ever evolving but there's also hope because there's queer people in Iran like that live there right now. Like I see their photographs, like there's this um, rainbow day where queer Iranians um, post photographs of themselves with their faces covered, but with rainbows behind them to show that they're still there. And then there's also the ins the idea of like, you know, there's the, Iran is also the country, the second country that performs the most transgender surgeries. So like as someone who's also transgender, like that is something that, 
is like still very much present there. So I think that like the fear may be a little bit overblown, but it does, there's a kernel of truth to it. that I think it's important to be cognizant of, but I don't wish to live my life in fear because if I did, I would get nothing done. So um, we have heard some wonderful words from all of our panelists today. Um, I'm so sorry, guys. Um, we, <laughs> I, as much as I like want to keep everyone, I'm like, oh, firm in their seats because this discussion is like amazing. Um, and I really want to keep it going. Um, I'm sorry to the EST people who are on Eastern time right now. Your eyebrows are probably like <laughs> flaring down. You're like, oh. I have to keep staring at my computer screen. Um, so I apologize for that, but um, you guys are free to go now um, since we do have to end it. But if you do have any concerns, you know, stay by, um, you know, ask us a question really quick. But all in all, today's discussion has been um, ended and please stay in tune for the things that, you know, our committee is gonna do in the future. We do have some really cool things in store. And once again, a big shout out to all of our wonderful guests. You guys really made this happen. And honestly, it was very free range in terms of the trajectory of what people would speak. But um, just having such a unique point of view from each individual person and kind of bringing out um, a different angle um, in terms of your experience and what you know about the community as well as what you hope to gain from it um, has just been beautiful, truly. Um, so yeah. Um, please stay behind if you have like any commentary, things that you need to say like in private, but all in all, um, you're welcome to all go. Just wanted to shout out uh, Fires on it for working so hard for the event and uh, to everyone else on the board, of course, but uh, Fires on in particular for really working hard. Um, so yeah, congrats Thank to everyone. Really appreciate it. Thank you so much, Fires on it. Thank you so much. This was amazing. Thank you all. And if anybody wants to stay connected, I, my info's in the chat. Hey, uh, I, I had a, uh, if some of us have a question for Rustin, if you want to stay on, um, you got cut off. You got cut it's off during your Monday thing. Night, I also good. don't want to keep anyone. So this is just a person. I don't know if there's a way to break up into groups or something. But. No, sure. Please go ahead. Because uh, you were saying something about changing the mindset in academia, because you literally your video froze for me at least at that point. Uh, and you said uh, the challenge was changing their, their minds about publishing stuff they're working on because then that sort of brings it out into the public and then someone else might snatch the idea or whatever it happens to be. How did you overcome that with Ajahn? That was, that was very interesting to me. I think so. There, there are two parts of that, right? So the first part is that um, I think it took me a long time to realize that the type of work that we're producing at Ajam is not the same type of work that we will be producing in a peer review journal, right? Mm -hmm. And in fact, like that's something that like we originally had, like that idea of like, oh yeah, we're just gonna talk about fun stuff that like, you know, how good is Arash's Persian, you know, for example. You know, <laughs> like, and then like, as we started to like, we saw like Ajam sh really changed as we changed, right? It became in, it became, a part of our professional lives, right? So it became something that, you know, people in academia knew us from Ajam, right? So like, it became very important, like, oh, what are, who are we citing? Which scholars are we interviewing? This and that. And I think what, as we started working, we realized that, okay, the first problem is um, this, this intellectual, like, uh, you know, domain bit, right? Where people are very hesitant. Um, I think, for, for me, it was always like, I'm, I'm a very pessimistic person. So I was like, oh, you know, I'm never gonna get a job in academia, whatever. So I, I always published all of my stuff like um, um, on Ajam first. And surprisingly, they get picked up by peer review article. Like people like reach out and like, actually we want this to be peer review. Can you submit it to us? So like uh -huh. that was one thing that happened, yeah. Um, another thing that happened was, um, I think just like having, um, there's, yeah, basically realizing and talking to scholars about like, because, and I think it's really important with the way scholarship is going now, like not only do you need to like have your CV like top notch, you also have to do public outreach. You also have to do, you know, like uh, digital humanities, public humanities, whatever those buzzwords mean, right? So like you can actually get people to be like, you know, like you should come on the podcast because like, it, you know, it's good, you know, it's good for your academic career. So in fact, like, I think, it's, it's a sad thing, really, because like, in fact, the job market is forcing you to put 
all this additional labor into doing these things that are, are not re they don't really count, um, but they do kind of still. So like, I think that we've managed to find a good balance where people recognize like, for example, like some of my favorite work has uh, by Ali Reza Dustar, who is a, a professor of religion at uh, University of Chicago. Like, He's been on a podcast with us, um, but at the same time, he'll like take a portion of something that he's interested in that's related to his book. And he'll write about it. So he wrote about um, uh, like horror and Ramadan specials in you know, Ramadan specials in Iran. So like, how did horror? the supernatural? Yeah, like horror scary films. Oh wow, okay. And like as like Ramadan serials, like you know, it's not something that would fit into his book, but like you know, he's he's interested in that. So we've kind of managed to work in this way that like if somebody finds one really cool thing um that they're they're gonna be like we, we kind of be like hey like okay that's not gonna be an article or a book but like you know you can write maybe two thousand words about it and not to take up everybody's time but also the last thing that's really important i think is um this idea that i'm also trying to really now that i'm a librarian and i'm learning my job on the go during covid which is crazy but also realizing that like all of us are our own archivists, especially academ uh, like academics, like we're going out and we're hoarding all this material, right? And I know for myself, I have like seven projects that I'm sitting on and I like know, oh, like, is this gonna be an or, like peer reviewed or, or like, you know, I'm just uh, thousands of materials just sitting and waiting for me to do something with them. But like, I'm starting to think like, well, maybe that's like, that needs to be changed, right? Like maybe there's things that we've already produced, like, or think about scholars that have like, hundreds like they've been producing stuff for decades like why can't we share that material with one another why can't we put it in a digital archive so like these are questions that i'm starting to think about is like if we think of scholarship more collaboratively like what do we gain out of that and i think that the sad thing is like the profession makes us do one thing but the objective is actually totally an the antithesis of it right which is that like it needs to be collaborative. It has to be open. It has to be free. It has to be open access. And instead, like, we're closing and we're closing and we're closing. And so I don't know what to do about it, but we're working on it, I guess. So. I think what, Boston, what you say is such a great idea about like creating a digital archive because I think so many of us who come from the, who are from the diaspora and want to talk about the around Iranian stories, not Iranian American, but Iranian stories feel that we lack data and we lack information to be able to accurately depict the kind of stories that we're trying to tell. So a, an easy accessible archive that we, you know, that we could access, I think would be so helpful to tell those kinds of stories, at least for me. So get on that rest. <laughs> I just, I just send it in the chat. You can see the Ajam oh, digital. Perfect. perfect. <laughs> oh, wow. Okay, perfect. That's awesome. Also, the Center for Iranian Diaspora Studies at San Francisco State is also doing a lot of great archivist work as well, especially in terms of like producing a documentary about different ways of immigration um, from Iranians coming to the U.S. and settling in Northern California. That's still in production right now, but I definitely think that we'll see more of this archivist um, like detailing moving forward like from from our generation like because we're we're creating it right now essentially and moving forward with it so i think it's like kind of make the change you want to see and also it's kind of sucks to wait because iranians are also like a fairly recent immigrant minority in the united states so we don't have like the long legacy like asian like I mean, asian american um like civil movements like coalescing with like the civil rights movement like with the like the second wave of women of women's rights movement. So those all kind of coalesced at the same time when a lot of us were still in Iran, our family was still in Iran, hadn't made it to the US yet at that time. So I think studying those movements really helped me kind of contextualize that and understand that like we're the generation that's gonna make that happen. So that was very interesting. I didn't expect to go on a full-fledged question. I love that. It's like no one wants to leave and I really don't want you guys to leave. I feel so bad. Um, but um, like I said, please stay if you guys like have any concerns, questions about ISC specifically. Um, panelists, if you're, you know, you want to stay, have any commentary for the event as well, you're free to do so. Um, but yeah, um, all in all, everyone, um, school teacher, you are dismissed. So bye bye. <laughs>